All right, good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. G'day. Um, I'm going to tell you about trees that grow. Um, but before I do, I'm going to tell you why I even dove down the hole of trees that grow. Um, it's about a problem that has plagued me for a long time in my programming. Um, and uh, I'd been using a particular technique to, to tackle this problem, and Trees That Grow is a paper that came out. It was written by um, um, Cheyenne and, and uh, Simon Peyton Jones um, a couple of years ago, and it promised to solve this problem even better than uh, I was currently doing. Um, so this problem um, is, is a bit difficult to phrase, um, especially in like 25 minutes. I'm going to do my best. Um, but you can kind of think of it like the expression problem um, that Phil Wadler talked about, um, and to, more, to a more general form um, in record types and so on. So I'll do my best to communicate this problem and, and what I've seen in trying to solve this problem. And maybe you've had this problem as well. Um, hopefully you have, and, and you maybe you have a better idea than I do. Um, so Trees That Grow originally came around or, or was motivated by this idea that there are three different data types that represent Haskell three different syntax trees. So there was the, the GHC data type, there was the template Haskell data type, and then there were libraries that represented Haskell. And it was, it was a very simple question, which is, um, how do we keep them all in sync? All right, so one bit of Haskell changes, they all need to be updated, and, and there were more. Um, we, you could have written one yesterday. How do we keep them all up to date? And how do we program against them in general? <clears throat> so um, that stops working. No. Yeah. So um, there's another way to look at this, um, and I'm going to give you one of my use cases. Um, have you ever had this problem? So you're writing a data type such as data aircraft, as I was. And an aircraft has a manufacturer and, and a designation, registration, and so on. So it's, it's a product type. It has these fields. And a category is a sum of these kinds of aircraft type, so you now have a product of a sum. And on the aeroplane constructor, you then have another product, so you now have a product of a sum of a product. And then you have another product, and so on, and so on, and you have a sum, and, and so on, and so on. So you've got this very complicated object graph of products and sums. So you write all your code in terms of this data type. You know, you, you might say, right down deep in the tree, you, you know, you're programming against that data type. Um, you might even store it in a database. Uh, so you, you, know, you create a database table, and it's got some columns and so on. And, uh, and this has happened to me before, uh, quite common, um, that this happens. Right? And they say, hey, can you just like, go down into this, this uh, object graph and just add in another field? And you're like, oh, no. I've programmed all the way down in this tree, and I need to just add one thing. It's going to bubble all the way up. Um, so yeah, th this is very similar to the expression problem uh, where you have a sum type and you, you, know, you want to add a case. You want to add a constructor, which means you have to update all of the use cases of that data type. Um, and Trees That Grow is, is a, is a uh, paper that's all about describing a technique for resolving that. So, um, so for example, we might have this uh, record data type um, with four fields, and we want to... Uh, we want to be able to add fields to this data type. Um, and we also, we want to be able to have uh, the undecorated case, that is, there are no fields added to it, and we want to come in later and potentially add fields to it. So Trees That Grow promises um, to resolve this issue by um, inserting in a type family field as well. And uh, by adding the unit instance, um, this is the undecorated case. All right? So because it's a product, unit is uh, one, so we multiply by one, that gives us the same thing. So if we set that type family field to unit, we have the undecorated case, as if we had not added anything at all. Um, it talks about um, this, little, this little problem that you might immediately run into, which is we have to pattern match every time in the undecorated case. So the goal here being using the undecorated case should be as easy as if I didn't try to decorate it to begin with. So it's suddenly got harder. But of course, we can just write a pattern synonym to make that all go away. And therefore, when we pattern match, it's as if it were undecorated. That it, that's exactly how we would use it if, uh, if we had not used trees that grow. So we're currently on equal par at this point in terms of ease of use, and uh, we have to do a little bit of work in the library itself. So then we can add an image 
um, as our potential use case. We can come along and add a field to this data type. Um, the data type doesn't need to change. The use cases haven't yet needed to change. <clears throat> and similarly, we can add constructors to some types. So, you know, have you ever wanted to add a constructor to either? Um, probably not. Um, but suppose you did. Uh, so th this, is, this is essentially the, uh, the expression problem in this case. Um, so uh, ac actually, in this case, we're adding a field to a sum type. Um, so when you think about it, um, or there's actually a way to algebraically express it, but by adding a, a, a value to each constructor of a sum type is the same thing as pairing that sum type up with that thing. All right, and that's just the distributive law of, of um, multiplication, over, uh, addition over multiplication. So um, again, we just instance unit for this value, and we're back to the undecorated case. So each of these constructors just multiplies by one when we use unit. <clears throat> uh, and we can, we can uh, add pattern synonyms again for some types, and, and uh, we don't have to keep ma matching out that unit. Um, and and the, yeah, the, the point that I was making there was there is a lens from our new either data type to that field. Okay? That is to say, um, there is always one available, um, and you can see them all on those constructors. <clears throat> so here's an example of having added a constructor to either. Okay? So this is a common data type called these. Um, you may have heard of it. Um, it's basically you've got it, um, either A or B, or you've got both. So we can add this constructor, um, but uh, we can also use the undecorated case. So in a sum type where our cases are, are summing, they're, they're adding up, we want to add zero in the undecorated case, or known as void. So we instance it for void, um, and we get that undecorated case. <clears throat> we add the pattern synonyms, and we get prisms for these things. So the, the technique that I was trying to, to use to resolve this problem is implement trees that grow. Um, I had to make a few variations to be satisfied with that. Um, and then use the lens library to, um, to generically access these constructors so that my calling code doesn't need to change when I do add a constructor or a new, in this case, instance for those type families. Um, and this, prom uh, this paper promises to continue working for ex existential types and GATTs, which is, is relevant, because I've found cases in alternative solutions where that's not true. So um, th this is more a question. Um, what am I doing wrong? OK, so I've hit some problems. Um, and what am I doing wrong? <clears throat> so <clears throat> there always seems to be a pretty significant penalty every time I try to do this. And when I do try to do this, I really do use an incredibly deep object graph just to demonstrate whether or not I can actually get to the goals. So um, I've been using um, classy lenses and classy prisms and, and so on for a while, um, which uh, Ed talked about yesterday in our workshop, if you were there. Um, so uh, who is familiar with this approach? Can I just get a bit of a cool? Right, OK. Um, so I've been using that for a while um, to try to resolve this, this problem. Um, so it looks like this, for those of you who, who have not seen it before. Um, we basically have a type class, and we say, um, this is the type class of all things that have an image. OK? And uh, we instance it for, in this case, the record type we had earlier. And the lens gives us the ability to get and set on, on all instances that have uh, of this type class. Um, the problem that I have with this, um, this approach is if deep down in the, the object graph, um, and I want to add an image or add a, add a field. I have to update that one down in the bottom, but then I have to update all of the other ones as it bubbles up to the top. And uh, as I'm writing this code, this is, this is like in real life, as I'm writing this code, I actually don't know where the top is. All right, because it, it goes, you know, I got up to aircraft, which is what I was doing, um, but that's just one thing. It just keeps going. Um, so the type variable that was in that type family. Um, has to bubble up to the top of the data type. So if you can imagine a tree of objects, and, and we add a type variable here, and it sits on this object here, and another one here, and another one here, and eventually they get up to the top of the tree, all of these type variables. And uh, just 
just to write an engine, which is what I was modeling, it, there were 18 type variables. Um, I can show you the code. And uh, like I'm sitting here going, am I doing this wrong? You know? <laughs> um, and not only that, I run out of names at 26. <laughs> so that's just me. So I, I kind of packed it in, and I just said, look, I'm, I must be doing something wrong here. Um, and uh, yeah, this is a question. Um, what am I doing wrong here? Um, aside from running out of identifier names at 26. I've heard there's more. <clears throat> so um, I'm just recently exploring the Backpack solution to this problem. Um, so Backpack's a module system for Haskell um, since GHC 8.2, I believe. And uh, the, the, the immediate problem I see with Backpack is I don't get all the the abstractions and generalizations that I do with classy prisms and lenses and so on. However, perhaps I can use bits of backpack such that I can continue using classy lenses and so on afterwards. Um, so I'm still working on that. <clears throat> so the way backpack, um, just to give you a brief um, understanding of backpack, um, because, because I only have a brief understanding myself, is uh, you write a signature file um, which basically defers the definition of the module. So you, you, so, um, you sort of say, here's my data type, here's what instances it should have, and then uh, in the implementation, you provide the value for that. So um, here's strings. We all love strings, right? So um, basically, the signature file is, we're going to have a data type called str. It's going to have instances of eq. It's going to have an instance of show. And uh, the, the uh, second component there is uh, the implementation. So the implementation in this case is a list of char. <clears throat> All right. Um, this, this, uh, the one problem I have run into in doing this is uh, it, you have to push some quantifiers up again, so you hit the same problem, except it's specialized this time. Like it, in, the, in the old case where I was uh, put, having to put a type variable on every single component inside the object graph to push it up, this only happens when it's an existential quantifier. And the reason being, I need to be able to access that ex existential quantifier. And if it's sitting down in the module, I need it to bubble up so that I can, so the example being here is um, ST, right? So I need to be able to get to that S in order to um, use what ST does. And I need to bubble it up. Otherwise, I just can't access it. Um, so I, have, I still prefer using classy lenses and prisms. Um, so, um, I, I, can't, I simply can't find a better answer to this problem than, than this for now. Um, I seem to have finished very early. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm keen to talk about this problem with uh, anyone. So does anyone have any questions? And thanks. <clears throat> Thank you. There's something yeah. about questions. I think you all just want to make me run one side to the other. There you go. I'm keen to hear your question. Hi, Tony. Um, <laughs> hey, I wonder if you could just talk a bit about the use cases in the paper yep. where they're actually applying this technique. Uh, yeah, so the, the primary use case given in the paper is, uh, is the, the different Haskell source syntax trees. Um, so um, to, to try and give you um, like a, uh, to sort of sympathize with this problem a bit, which is uh, imagine you had to write a Haskell syntax tree. You, you would end up with products and, of sums and, and so on. And uh, as you're doing so, you, perhaps you want to make a change to the language, OK? So we want to add backpack or something to Haskell. And so you, make a, you add this new keyword called signature to the, to the syntax tree. And uh, all, of the, all of the syntax trees will now have to be updated for however many there are. What we'd really like to say is um, for any syntax tree that has the notion of signatures and program against this kind of thing. So trees that grow is basically, um, they're trying to write the whole syntax tree and put in that type family so that later on when they say, oh, we're going to add this feature, they can just slot it in with a type family instance. So that's the primary motivation. Um, I'm, I'm motivated in, in like the aircraft case. I have many other case, programming language cases. Um, one of our projects at, at, um, in Brisbane is, uh, is working with Python, the programming language. So we have a Python syntax tree. Um, the goal for, for that project is to help people write Python. 
Um, so it's written in Haskell, and we wrote it for version 3.5 of Python. But what does the, you can imagine there's a 3.5 Python syntax tree and a 3.6 version syntax tree. Where do they differ? And so we could potentially use trees that grow, so where there's additional instructions in the two different uh, syntax trees, if that helps. This one here. Yep, keep me going. This is one. <laughs> oh, yeah. So you mentioned that one issue was that you had lots of type variables to pass into these things. Mm -hmm. Could you pack those all up into a single variable that ranges over products of type variables? Uh, yes, and I, I did try this. Yeah, so I, I probably should have mentioned that, which is I did try to pack them all up into a single type variable. But the problem with this is uh, um, the kind, like you lose a bit of flexibility with that. So whatever you set that value to, it propagates through the whole tree. But I, I might need differences down the tree. So it is true if, for example, you know, your project manager said, add an image to everything, right, all the way down the tree. And there was just one type variable, I just go image, and then that, that solves the problem. But when you get, you want to discriminate at the different values down in the tree. Um, so my goal was just to get like ultimate flexibility, like what can I get here? Um, but I, I did experiment with that compromise, um, but I found it unsatisfactory. Well, what I would have done in that case is added coercion functions that take, let's say at one point you need a product of 26 variables, but another mm -hmm. product point you only need 13 of them. Yes. Right, you have a coercion function that extracts the 13 from the 26. Okay, I'm not familiar with that. So can you expand on that a little bit? What do you mean by that? Um, typical subtyping. Okay. Right, a, a product of 13 things is, yep. a product of 26 things is a subtype of a product of 13 things. Yep. So you can convert any product of 26 into a product of 13. Right. So you could do that implicitly sometimes, or you do it explicitly. Oh, I see. Explicit. Yeah, it's okay. a coercion function. I, yeah, I understand by, what you mean by the coercion function. Um, I did not experiment with that. Um, perhaps I should. Yeah. Maybe it would help. The other yeah. thing I was going to suggest is um, have a look at Agda. The mm -hmm. reason for that being, right, Haskell sort of gets halfway to dependent types. Agda's all the way. So any of these dependencies you want can be written out in Agda. Mm -hmm. might be painful, I don't know. But Agda should give you the right language for describing these things, one hopes. And if okay. you could solve it in Agda, maybe then once you saw what the solution was, you could back translate it to Haskell. Okay, so, so it might be just worth fiddling with that, because Agda might give you the right language for describing right. your problem. So in that Agda has full dependent types, and therefore I might be able to describe the problem better. The dependent types being the thing More that helps. cleanly. Right, yeah. okay. Uh, yeah, good point. I haven't done that either. Okay, so it's yeah. just an idea. I think you're working yeah. with a really hard I, I think they're both excellent ideas. Thank lots you. Lots of different tools to get at it. Yep. Thanks very much. Uh, Brian? Could you uh, show us some code? Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see what I can do. Uh, I didn't prepare any, but I can do my best here. So. Oh, yeah, sorry. You haven't had your question. Uh, so, so my request was um, I, I didn't quite follow the data structure you were walking through the first time you walked through it. The aircraft one or the? Uh, uh, just the idea itself, what that looked like. Oh, right. Um, <laughs> because it was very fun. Do you want to see the real code? I can show you that code yeah, as well. Yeah, so just, just um, I, I, I can't show you the trees that grow code because I deleted it and, uh, in, in a tantrum. Um, and, uh, and so. <laughs> It's probably there somewhere in my history, but it, um, so I'll show you, I'll answer Brian's question, um, and then I'll show you some code. So um, I've just noticed that it's, this is called trees that grow that I like, and it's probably not true anymore. Um, so, ah, hang on, sorry, let me get an internet. <clears throat> um, while I do that, uh, I'll show you the real code. Uh, so, uh, so if we take, for example, uh, nope, hang on. Yeah, exactly. Uh, are, you, are you talking about these data structures? Yeah. That's, there's directories here as well. Um, <laughs> uh, so if I go to, so this is at the top level. 
Um, and and it, uh, it definitely would have been uh, more than 26 type variables at this level. So remember it was 18 at propulsion, which is just the engine, all right? And uh, at that point, I just threw the towel in. Um, but uh, here I'm using classy lenses to get around this problem. Um, and and j just to kind of give you a bit of sympathy for this problem, um, particularly in aviation, um, very discrete questions get asked all the time. Um, like, I'll give you a silly example, like, um, how many aeroplanes did you fly on a Tuesday that had two stripes down the fuselage? Like, it's just such a silly question, but these kind of things actually happen. And uh, I, I have seen, uh, I've seen these questions be asked in a safety critical environment where people with fancy t-shirts and stuff sit there with a pen and paper on the monitor and start counting like this to, to answer these kinds of questions and then always get the wrong answer, right? <laughs> Every single time. So I, I, what I'm trying to do here is, is answer these questions where I can just write the lens and say, there's the question and then say, get, and there's the answer. Um, so um, that's at the top level of the tree there. Um, but if you take, say, uh, is it propulsion? Oh, that's a pretty uninteresting one, actually. So uh, engine. Like, you know, aircraft have engines. And this is just talking about aircraft, right? Like, that's not the only thing we ever talk about. Um, again, this is a record type. Um, I have, yeah. You associate media, like I've associated media with it um, because people want to see the picture of the aeroplane or, or whatever it might be. Um, or, um, you know, if you do a flight, for example, you want the track log, the GPS track log or flight plan and, and so on. So this is an example of where I'm currently at in resolving this problem. Um, my use case being, um, I, I guess my, my thesis is basically... Uh, I'm going to sit at an airport one day and someone is going to ask me the most obscene, obtuse question that you could possibly think of. Like, you know, the date is a prime number. The registration has, you know, a vowel in the third position. Like, just, just come up with the silliest question you can come up with and I should be able to answer it. That's my goal, all right? Um, it sounds silly, but these kinds of questions actually get asked. Um, and, and actually, I guess the other motivating thing is um, I, I have this, uh, I guess, perverse hobby of going on pilot forums and tracking uh, what happens. Like, people will go on there and say, oh, you know, um, I'm using Microsoft Excel to, to, for this data, um, but I got asked this question today and I didn't know what to do. And, you know, th this happens, uh, and it's about once a week on average um, that I see this kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a problem that I'm trying to solve. Um, now to Brian's question. Um, this was my experiment with trees that grow. Um, now let me try to remember what I was doing. So um, yeah, it, it, so what, what I was, this doesn't work. Um, it, it, like it, it especially doesn't work. Um, but what I was trying to do is create a data type to which I could add either fields or constructors all at once. Um, and that, that actually doesn't work. So, um, pardon me. You can see here, th this is adding a field, this, this particular type family here. And uh, there should be a lens for it somewhere. Um, and then I am adding a constructor. So basically, I, just w I wanted a general sum type to which I could add constructors or fields. And then similarly, I wanted a general product type, such as this one, to which I could add um, constructors or fields. Um, and, you know, there should be a prism for this. There is a prism for that. That works out. Um, there, there is this little bit of a problem here. Um, if, it depends how much you know about prisms and, and traversals and so on, which is, um, uh, even in the undecorated case, you don't get a prism that goes to just that value. So in this case, we get a prism to the pair. Um, so like you, you essentially, you have a traversal over this, over this A. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I can do a quick lens tutorial. But uh, <laughs> think, like, if, if you've got a prism to a pair, um, there's a lens from a pair to one component of that pair. And if you compose a lens and a prism, you end up with a traversal, and a traversal is weaker in power than a prism. 
and I was not prepared to make that compromise. So I immediately hit that problem, um, and so on. There are prisms, et cetera, et cetera. So is that a good enough? Yeah, cool. Uh, we can talk all about this code, and, and the subsequent revisions is probably better to talk about, um, because I, I threw the towel in on that one as well. Cool, thanks for your, thanks for your, your questions. Um, quite interesting, cheers. <clears throat> Thank you.